and welcome to our first webinar of the winter spring season. Today we are joined by our webinar partner Renewable Hydrogen Alliance for a part two in our Renewable Hydrogen series. We will be joined by panelists to discuss renewable hydrogen programs. Uh, this webinar this morning is brought to you in support by Toyota. Thank you so much for your support. My name is Symbia Youssef, Member Relations Manager at Ford. I have some brief announcements before I pass it along to Connor Herman, uh, Ford's Program Manager and our moderator today. Attendees, we ask that you please be sure to submit all your questions through the attendee chat. We will get through them after all of the presentations this morning during the Q&A. We will also be sending out the webinar recording and presentation after the webinar. New Year, so let's start with an introduction to Ford. Ford is a nonprofit trade association advocating for smart transportation. We are working in four main focus areas, which are our industry development, demonstration projects, policy advocacy, and consumer engagement. Through these efforts, we aim to advance equitable, clean transportation for all. If you would like more information about Forth, you want to join our member list, our great member list, you can get more information about our events. Those could be found at our website at fortmobility.org. We have curated 10 amazing webinars this season. Our topics will cover equity and micromobility, induction char charging, financing transportation electrification programs, electrified waterways, and electric aviation and more. If you're interested in supporting any of these webinars as a sponsor, uh, any of this upcoming topics, we uh, you can feel free to reach out to myself. My email will be in the chat. We are switching our roadmap into a virtual format in 2021 due to COVID. Uh, the 2021 Virtual Roadmap Conference will be held on the new dates, uh, June 14th through the 16th of 2021 for three days of programming. For more information about roadmap, ticket sponsorship, tickets and sponsorship, you can contact Ashley Duplanty at roadmapfort.org or Ashley D at fourthmobility.org. These informations will be shared in the recap email as well. And now I'll pass it along to our moderator today, our moderator, Connor. Connor. Hey, thanks for kicking things off, Symbia. Uh, hello, everyone. As Symbi mentioned, I'm Connor Herman, program manager here at Fourth. Well, I've not worked too much in the renewable hydrogen space personally, much of my work is focused around helping utilities in developing transportation electrification programs and strategies. And from storage to mobility applications, renewable hydrogen is an exciting and growing opportunity for utilities. So I'm happy to be here today with a stacked panel to learn and discuss this interesting topic. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a moment to introduce our lineup of speakers. First up, we have Martina Steinkutz, um, the Interim Executive Director at the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance. Martina joined the Portland-based RHA in 2019. Before moving to the Pacific Northwest, she was based in Brussels, Belgium, where she led Europe's major hydropower advocacy groups, communication activities, and coordinated EU-co-funded small hydro project, hydropower projects touching upon diverse communities in the European Union. Martina holds a German-British double degree in business and received a master's in urban studies from the University of Vienna. After that, we'll hear from Jason Sakan. He is uh, an advanced technology research senior consultant at Toyota and is responsible for expanding hydrogen infrastructure for fuel cell electric vehicles and piloting new applications of fuel cells in areas other than light duty passenger vehicles. Prior to joining Toyota, he worked at McKinsey & Co., where he led projects for automotive, transportation, and energy clients focused on vehicle electrification and charging infrastructure. He holds an MBA and an MS in natural resources from the University of Michigan and a BS from Georgia Tech. Following Jason, we're here from Dave Warren, the principal at the Warren Group LLC. Dave formed uh, the Warren Group as a lobbying and consulting firm in 2018. Previously, Dave served as Legislative Director for the Washington State Commissioner of Public Lands and as the Energy Services Director and Government Relations Director for the Washington Public Utilities District Association for almost 14 years. 
Today's clients include the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, Douglas County PUD, Western States Hydrogen Alliance, and more, and was the lead lobbyist in several relevant legislations in Washington. Dave holds a BS in civil engineering and MS in environmental engineering from the University of New Mexico. Following, we'll hear from Mike McCann. Mike is the electric generation manager for Eugene Water and Electric Board. As such, Mike is responsible for all utility-owned generation, which includes about 150 megawatts of hydroelectric power, 20 megawatts of wind, and 43 megawatts of waste energy steam cogeneration. Mike has been with eWeb since 2002 and has served as the electric generation manager since 2014. Prior to becoming the generation manager, Mike spent 12 years in the environmental compliance and hydropower relicensing group at eWeb. Mike is a registered professional engineer in Oregon with 35 years of engineering and operations experience in the public and private sectors. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering from Clarkson University. And last but not least, we hear from Catherine Reed, marketing manager at Ballard Power Systems. Catherine has spent 18 years in the clean energy sector as an experienced champion of heavy duty motive applications at Ballard. Focused on the bus and truck markets, Catherine leads marketing campaigns with significant analysis, research and industry outlook data to create comprehensive information for Ballard's audiences and customers. Catherine is responsible for delivering lead generation and nurturing initiatives, social media campaigns, digital and content marketing, technical writing, and sales tools to support revenue generation and thought leadership. Catherine holds a BBA from Simon Fraser University with a marketing concentration. So if this panel doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. So before I hand it over to our first panelist, we have a few poll questions for our attendees to kick things off. So Simbi, if you wanna go ahead and launch that, the first question is, what do you consider the biggest hurdle in converting commercial fleets to 100% zero emissions? And then a second question there, and I don't know if everybody was able to see those results, but it was a battle there between uh, costs was looking like it was leading that one. So the second question, how much H2 can you safely put into a natural gas pipeline to blend with the CH4? This is a complete guess for me, but fifteen percent seems to be uh, seems to be taking the taking the lead. All right. Well, thanks everybody for participating in those. And yeah, a reminder to please submit questions through the attendee chat, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. So now I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to our first speaker, Martina. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today with me and learning about the intersection of renewable hydrogen and utilities. I'd like to talk about these three questions today. So let's kick it off. What is the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance? We are a trade association about two and a half years old and located in Portland, Oregon. We now have more than 70 diverse members and all of our uh, panelists today are actually also our members. These include electric and gas utilities, manufacturers, clean energy and clean transportation advocacy organization. We even have a Native uh, American tribe, law firms, consultants um, and many project developers. Um, our mission is to promote using renewable electricity to produce climate neutral fuels because we want to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels. So what are climate neutral fuels and what is renewable hydrogen? 
renewable hydrogen is actually a clean fuel or a climate neutral fuel. Similar to um, electricity, it is an, considered as an energy carrier. So, but how do we produce renewable hydrogen? So there is a um, process that we refer to, it's called electrolysis. And as you see in the picture on the side, it's, it, is, it is a very complicated word uh, maybe to remember, but it's a very simple process. Just think of it as like a bucket of water and you run um, an electricity current through that water. In that process, you have uh, a chemical process that's happening, which is um, uh, hydrogen is being created, which you can capture. And the other thing that's being created is oxygen, which you could release. So um, then now that you have captured this hydrogen, it can be used in various ways. One is to use it as a transportation fuel, as a power supply, energy storage, but also as an, for example, as an industrial feedstock, because maybe many of you don't know, in order to produce um, uh, fertilizers or cement or steel, many of these industries are reliant on hydrogen as an input. But as of today, the hydrogen is created mostly from fossil fuels. Well, there are other ways now how we can produce hydrogen, which is from renewable electricity. And that's what we are about. So what's all the hype uh, about it and why is it happening now? As you may know, here, for, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of renewable electricity. And as we're building out more and more renewables, and depending on these renewable sources, there will be times where we just have too much renewable electricity that we cannot use at the same time, and we um, cannot sell it, or we cannot store it in you know, batteries. So what is happening is that much of that energy is going to waste. But in, instead of wasting it, we could, you know, have a better use for it. Um, for example, to create those clean fuels. Um, and to emphasize this is also because um, we have a lot of these costs for the equipment is also currently falling. Because as you look at the global map, a lot of other countries worldwide, like Australia, also a lot of countries in the uh, European Union or Japan and South Korea have invested a lot of money to um, to have an, an hydrogen economy and a lot of projects going on. Unfortunately, not much so, so much in the US, but now that it's getting very competitive, we are starting as well as a nation to look into renewable hydrogen. Um, so what the message I would like to give to you is that hydrogen is not a fuel of the future, as many say, it's actually happening today. Just have a look at this picture. It's um, a utility scale electrolyzer um, in Norway, and it's dating back to 1919. So let's start using locally produced, low cost renewable electricity to create clean fuels, because this in the end will be a win-win situation for the industry, the economy, our climate, and also for the many frontline communities affected by fossil fuel hydrogen infrastructure these days. Thank you. Great, thank you, Martina. Now we're gonna hear from our second speaker, Jason. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be a bit brief so that we can save a bit more time for Q&A. Um, so I, I think, you know, thinking about hydrogen, to in my mind, the real advantage is how it helps with hard to decarbonize areas, as well as the sort of um, resiliency benefits that you get from decoupling energy generation from energy demand, right? So as we're seeing increasing renewable penetration on the grid, um, we're seeing uh, that sort of balancing when that renewable energy is being created doesn't always necessarily match up when it's being used. Uh, for solar, maybe it does pretty well with you know air conditioning usage in summer and those sorts of things. Uh, but for wind or uh, hydroelectric, like curtailed hydroelectric power, 
uh, that's uh, pretty frequent uh, up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, having that instantaneous link might not necessarily be there. Um, so I, I think this this graphic from NREL does a pretty good job of just kind of explaining the inner dynamic that you know hydrogen in and of itself is not um, you know a, a generation asset, right? It's a it's a means of carrying electricity, much like the electric grid is. Um, so, you know, why renewable hydrogen and why now? I mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, but basically renewable energy is uh, abundant and cheap now. Uh, it's the, the costs have dramatically dropped and uh, you, you now have sort of a price competitive and in some cases cheaper means of producing hydrogen with these low, low cost of electricity. You know, once you start hitting about two cents per kilowatt hour, that's when it can make a, a lot of economic sense to do renewable hydrogen from electricity. Um, I do want to share this sort of, I, I mentioned the, the supply and demand sort of imbalances. This is a slide I, I shamelessly stole from uh, Jack Brower at UC Irvine, but I like this because it's looking at a simulation for a 100% renewable grid in California. And you can see sort of when you have, uh, this is over the course of an entire year, and you see when you have sort of deficits in electricity versus surpluses in electricity. So again, the challenge is ma matching that instantaneous supply and demand. And I think on the bottom, it's really helpful to put sort of the scale. So the, the pumped hydro is, you know, all of the, the pumped hydro uh, potentially available in California. Uh, the hydrogen storage uh, is actually, if you were to convert your natural gas grid over to hydrogen, that is the available storage uh, potential that you have. And then that skinny bar to the right is if you had 21 million battery electric vehicles, the amount of power that they'd be able to provide. So I think it's super helpful because it shows sort of scale the magnitude that we're talking about um, you know batteries are fantastic for grid balancing in sort of the you know minute hour maybe even up to a day kind of perspective but when you start talking you know multiple days or seasonal or things like that uh, the the cost effectiveness uh, just becomes challenging uh, and then sort of how this relates to uh, you know electric vehicles I, I think the, the one point that I want to emphasize is that you know find that a lot of times people get into this, oh, it's battery electric, or oh, it's fuel cell electric. I mean, I've, I've spent years working on both and the infrastructure for both. Uh, it, it's not an either or, it's, it's a both. If we want to decarbonize transportation, we will have to have both. Uh, these are two complementary technologies, not competitive technologies. Uh, you know, hydrogen, fuel cell electric vehicles uh, have their, their own areas in which they uh, can better suit customer needs than battery electric vehicles. So for example, if you have a vehicle that's just, you know, your commuter vehicle, you're going to and from work, I mean, a battery electric vehicle makes sense today. If you have, you know, uh, something like uh, forklifts and distribution center, right? It's a smaller vehicle, but they're used constantly 24 by seven, three shifts. You can't have any sort of downtime for charging or anything like that. The fast refuel time of a fuel cell vehicle makes sense there talking heavier duty trucks, again, sort of that power scaling dynamic. Um, for heavy duty trucks, it makes a lot of sense as well. Um, so I know that I've got one minute left and you know I wouldn't be working for an automotive company if I didn't plug a vehicle that we have. So we did just uh, uh, launch our, our new Toyota Mirai. It's a brand new version uh, for this model year. Uh, kind of I've got some of the key specs there, but the big takeaways on it, just the, the range, uh, 400 miles. And again, you sort of have that, that fast refuel time of, you know, three to five minutes to fill up the vehicle. Um, happy to answer any questions about that or anything I talk about later. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And next, we're going to hear from Dave Warren. Go ahead, Dave. Um, yeah, thanks. That's Dave Warren here. Um, I will speak both on policies. I'm from Washington State, for those of you that uh, uh, are not part of that discussion early on, the introductions. Um, Washington State, in the last two years, two years ago, hydrogen hit upon the, the, uh, the state policymakers, uh, largely initially through the efforts of Douglas County Public Utility District, who is a client of mine. Douglas PUD is a a utility in central Washington that serves about 20,000 customers. It's on the main stem of the Columbia uh, that runs the Columbia River that runs through Washington State, and it's 100% hydroelectric. Uh, they own an 840 megawatt wells hydroelectric project. 
Um, the general manager a couple years ago started looking at their surpluses in the spring. Uh, they're in about what's called a balancing area authority. Um, and in the spring, they give away their electricity because they can't run it over the spillway for uh, they would violate dissolved gas standards uh, and hurt fish. So they have to generate electricity and they have to either give it away or what's called negative pricing, pay someone to take it. So they started penciling out using that excess electricity for uh, production of renewable hydrogen. PUDs in, in the state of Washington need specific authorities in law. And uh, the general manager approached me about uh, running a bill to give authority to PUDs to produce and or distribute renewable hydrogen. So in, in 2019, um, Senate Bill 5588, sponsored by Senator Brad Hawkins, uh, provides that authority to produce and distribute renewable hydrogen and also the authority to own and or operate hydrogen fueling stations. Uh, also in the 2019 session, House Bill 2042, the Green Transportation Act, uh, we were successful in getting amendments into that bill to provide sales and use tax credits for, for renewable hydrogen production facilities, uh, for hydrogen fueling uh, stations and infrastructure, uh, equivalent to the battery electric vehicle uh, incentives and, and uh, charging infrastructure and grant programs, and, and, and that bill established in many ways the equivalency of fuel cell electric vehicles with battery electric. And as Jason said, it's not an either or. Uh, uh, there are uh, advantages and strengths to both, and we will need both. This year, uh, Senator Hawkins has Senate Bill 5000 to provide a 50% sales and use tax reduction for any new fuel cell electric vehicles and 100% exemption for used fuel cell electric vehicles beginning in July 1 of 2022 until the credits used to purchase or lease 650 light and medium duty passenger vehicles and light duty trucks. Um, this will start to catch up with the incentives offered to battery electrics. We also in this legislature have a low carbon fuel standard that's expected to pass and a cap and invest bill. We also um, last year passed a bill that determined that, that uh, Washington would start to adopt rules to adopt California's zero emission vehicle uh, mandates. Uh, Washington, as a reminder, is the third most populous state west of the Mississippi, I like to say, after California and Texas. Uh, and and uh, we have become open for business. We're heavy hydroelectric. And I'll get into that. Douglas County PUD, as I, as I introduced, um, has gone into hydrogen production. They are constructing the state's first five megawatt renewable hydrogen electrolyzer, which is due online uh, this fall. And um, they are building the infrastructure so that they can add uh, in phases multiple uh, more megawatts, perhaps up to 50 megawatts, maybe more of electrolyzer uh, facilities over the next few years as we develop simultaneously the end use markets. Um, so I, I described this sort of balancing area authority. Uh, they also put 10 to 15 megawatts into the grid as a BAA um, for free for spinning reserves and other contingency reserves. And when you can put that into an electrolyzer, if it's called on um, to go onto the grid, you can turn the electrolyzer off. So that's another area where uh, Gary Ivory, the general manager, said that was wasted electricity in essence. So the value proposition, the point is for in the hydro system and other variable renewables, uh, electrolyzer, electrolytic hydrogen has value to grid integration in ways that will fundamentally bring the cost. Uh, down as well. And then um, last March, Douglas County PUD and the Bonneville Environmental Foundation were awarded a grant from the Centralia Coal Transition Board to build the first renewable hydrogen fueling station in the Pacific Northwest um, using Douglas County's renewable hydrogen. And Toyota, as part of the grant program, will provide 10 Marais uh, so that fleet managers and others can start so called kicking the tires. Um, again, it's a, it's a supply chain from the production down to the end use. Um, and another sort of groundbreaking area, uh, Tacoma Power, 
last fall is the first utility in the U.S. to establish what they call their electrofuels tariff, specifically designed to attract uh, electrolyzers into using uh, Tacoma Power's hydroelectric uh, generation. They are surplus much of the year, um, 40 megawatts or so. Uh, um, and again, they have seen the value that electrolyzers can bring. They are not looking to build their own like Douglas County PUD is, uh, but to rather to attract electrolyzer developers uh, to build electrolysis. They also, have, of course, the picture, they have a huge port in Tacoma, one of the largest ports on the West Coast. Uh, so port handling facilities, dredge vehicles, uh, cargo handling uh, vehicles are all potential uh, targets uh, for, for the end use of vehicles. Electrolyzers, as I said, can be interrupted very short notice, extended period of time. And that's part of their tariff uh, up to 15% uh, during the year that Tacoma Power can interrupt the use of that electrolyzer and then use that electricity out on the grid where it's needed. Um, that's the quick. Um, I hope I got in under my time limit. I'll have questions um, towards the end, I guess. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Dave. And next we'll hear from Mike to discuss some of the initiatives over at eWeb. Yeah, good morning and thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar. I'm going to begin here with a brief introduction about eWeb because it will help all of you understand how we got here. Um, we are like uh, the two utilities Dave just mentioned, Douglas County and, and Tacoma. Um, we, but we are a large municipal utility um, uh, and uh, we're owned by the citizens of Eugene. We supply drinking water and electricity. Um, we are large by municipal standards. We are small compared to like Pacific Core or PGE. So we're, we're probably a middle sized utility overall. We have 90,000 electric customers. And, and I think the important part is that we own some of our own generation. We supply, depending on the year, somewhere around 20% of our own generation with wind, hydro, and, uh, and waste energy cogen. Uh, within the Bonneville Balancing Authority, so th uh, this is the system power you get from Bonneville. It's mostly hydro, as you would expect. There is also some wind, but it's important to mention that there is some gas and coal associated with it too. So it's not entirely green. Um, the amount of coal is decreasing as we go into the future. The amount of natural gas, though, is staying about steady or increasing uh, because they need natural gas to balance the wind energy. So it's the point here is it's not entirely green. And here's what eWeb system power looks like. So it's it's mostly Bonneville, like I said, and then we also own our own gen <coughs> excuse me, our own generation. It's mostly hydro. Um, and we make our own market purchases. <coughs> the market purchases um, may also have some carbon associated with it, depending on what's available when we do it. But by and large, our system power is about 90 to 95 percent green with you know somewhere depending on the year five to for 10 percent of uh, electricity has carbon associated with it so this is an important slide and it gets to something that dave mentioned uh, a few minutes ago um, we uh, like other utilities in the northwest have surplus energy at different times of the year so eweb's system load uh, over the course of the year is generally around 300 average megawatts. Our energy supplies are uh, somewhere, depending on, on the year, uh, in excess of 350 megawatts. And so we have excess that we are selling. Um, we generally sell it uh, into the market, but the biggest market is into California. Um, in 2010, we lost our second largest customer, which is a chip manufacturer that produced about 10 average megawatts. So that gave some of the uh, uh, some of the excess. We've never gotten that back. The recession from 2010 also caused our loads to go down, and and they've been pretty flat since then. Um, when I took over as generation manager in 2014, we were selling about 70 average megawatts per year, uh, mostly into California and mostly at a loss. Um, this is green energy from the Pacific Northwest and, and we're selling it into California as a loss. And, and so this bothered me and I started to look around for options, just like the folks at Douglas uh, PUD did and the folks at uh, Tacoma were doing. Um, 
it's an it's important for uh, to recognize that energy is a commodity and the energy market is very fluid. Um, right now, at this moment, there are spot prices, there are hour ahead prices, there are day ahead prices, and 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 uh, going on to the future, you can buy energy for you know three years from now. And there are many trading hubs within the uh, Western interconnect that all have different prices. But in the Pacific Northwest, we're generally energy rich in the spring. Uh, when hydro is flowing and the wind is blowing and the solar is out and our um, and our climate is fairly mild. And at that time, prices can go to zero or or negative, like uh, like they mentioned, you know, we give power away in the spring. Um, we're also a winter peaking region because we need that that energy for heating load. And so our demand and our prices peak in December and January. Uh, so. You know, I started thinking, how do we store energy from the spring when we have surplus and use it in the winter? And and as uh, Jason Jason showed on his slide, uh, batteries can't do it. Batteries are great for like 24, maybe 48 hours. Pumped hydro can't do it. You can store water in a pumped hydro system for a couple of weeks. But it turns out we can do it by making and storing hydrogen. Um, and uh, as also was mentioned earlier, people around the globe are already doing this. Here's a slide that you saw earlier, um, but if we take basically all of the inputs, to the electric grid and can use that to, to generate hydrogen and then store the hydrogen, there's many possible uses for it. One of the possible uses, of course, is to turn it back into electricity when we need it. Um, we can also uh, put it into a natural gas pipeline. Um, and uh, so once we realized we could start uh, making hydrogen with our excess electricity, we started looking for partners. Um, we realized as the, uh, as the water and electric utility in Eugene, um, we would produce way more hydrogen than we could ever use. And, and we needed partners. And so we started talking to people like Toyota and Northwest Natural Gas, which is the gas utility in Eugene. Um, Northwest Natural is interesting um, because they're working to decarbonize their gas system. And so if we could together work together to take eWeb's excess electricity and use an electrolyzer to produce green hydrogen, we could then put the hydrogen directly into the natural gas pipeline and help them decarbonize their, uh, their system. So this is a good point to, to bring up the question uh, that was asked earlier, how much hydrogen can you put directly into the natural gas pipeline? And uh, I was responsible for that question, and I will admit it was a bit of a trick question because the answer is it depends. It depends on the on the natural gas utility, and it depends on what work has been done within their system. Um, for Northwest Natural, it turns out that right now the answer is zero because they're they're still investigating how, what the right amount is, and it's probably a couple of years till they they figure out what they can safely accept in their, their system. Um, in other places in the U.S. Some of the utilities are using putting in five to five to six percent. Some of the utilities are putting in up to ten percent. And I know uh, I think it's Hawaii where uh, where there's a utility putting in uh, about twelve percent uh, uh, straight hydrogen into the system. But in the Northwest, it's going to be a little while until utilities figure it out. Um, and so this led to the current project that we have. And this is a this slide shows a uh, a schematic of the of the current project we're envisioning. It's eWeb and Northwest Natural working together. We're gonna to take eWeb system power and water and use an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. We're then gonna combine the hydrogen with CO2 captured from a neighboring industrial source to produce what we're calling blue methane. And then Northwest Natural can take that methane and put it directly into their natural gas pipeline at the plant. This works because we're taking excess green energy from the grid and turning it into methane that we're using to displace natural gas that's extracted from the subsurface. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, I'll also mention we've been talking about taking a slipstream off of the hydrogen project to uh, use it as a fueling station because Eugene currently doesn't have a hydrogen fueling station. And if we can make that work, we'll also uh, we'll set up a fueling station that we can use for eWeb's fleet and some other fleets in the area and potentially as a commercial uh, venture get all those Marais fueled up in, in Eugene. 
Uh, so to button this up, we have plans on paper. We have a piece of ground that we're working on. We're working on agreements. And if all goes well, we hope to break ground later this year and be operational in 22. Thank you. Awesome. Exciting stuff going on over there in Eugene. So to close things out, uh, last but not least, we'll hear from Catherine. Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, I'm Catherine Reed, Marketing Manager at Ballard. For those aren't, that aren't familiar with us, we are a fuel cell manufacturer. Our primary focus for our products are heavy duty vehicles. So we have uh, fuel cells powering buses, trucks operating around the world. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those fleets and also um, how we're using green hydrogen to fuel those in our industry. So really, um, the pandemic has given us a good preview of the kind of socio and economic disruptions that could happen with climate change. But it also offers us a chance to rebuild a cleaner, more sustainable world. Countries are starting to implement uh, economic recovery plans, and they're including um, a focus on fighting climate change. And often um, there's a hydrogen element to that. We know what needs to happen to make the transition possible to decarbonization. We need to improve the efficiency. We need to completely decarbonize our electricity. We need to power everything we can with batteries. But where batteries don't make sense, we need to look to other technologies that can be generated, um, generating power completely zero emission. And hydrogen is one of those. So fuel cell buses and trucks are a reality today. There's over 6,000 vehicles operating around the world. Vehicles powered by Ballard's fuel cells have traveled more than 50 million kilometers, and we're seeing lifetime on the fuel cell of over 30,000 hours. So that means it's going to be um, likely only one major service event over the life of the vehicle. So these vehicles are in the field, performing well, operating around the world. Um, we're seeing many applications like transit buses, class eight drage trucks, mining vehicles really taking off. And globally, there's a vision uh, offered by the Hydrogen Council to see more than half a million fuel cell buses and trucks on the road within um, the decade. So our focus at Ballard is on heavy duty motive applications. And these applications really, uh, they, they are a middle ground for the, the options of either battery or hydrogen fuel cell technology. Vehicles that travel set routes in limited areas um, are really the low hanging fruit for batteries. They perform well there. But if you're looking at longer distances, higher utilization, vehicles that need to carry heavier loads, um, there's some challenges, including the weight of the battery, the high power needs for fast charging. And that's really where Ballard sees an opportunity for fuel cells. The, the technologies are complementary, but when we look ahead to the future where vehicles need to be 100% zero emission, 100% electric, um, we see the technologies as complementary. There's going to be in a fleet a combination of battery vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. And um, that's being reinforced to the marketplace. We're seeing companies making investments, including Daimler, Volvo, Bosch, Cummins. Um, Daimler specifically has said we're betting on both batteries and fuel cells. Um, we see an opportunity for a mix of those vehicles in fleets. And why is that? Well, really, um, fuel cells are best suited for applications with long range requirements, heavier play payloads, the need for route flexibility too. Um, we see fuel cell vehicles performing very well where there's a need for climbing power in hilly conditions or highway speed. Because of the superior energy density of hydrogen, vehicles um, can operate at higher speeds, highway speeds over a longer period of time without uh, refueling. Fuel cell trucks are also hauling comparable payloads to diesel trucks already. And we see areas for continued improvement through lower weight storage tanks and improved integration into the vehicle itself to um, eventually be in a place where fuel cell trucks can carry um, full payloads comparable to diesel. 
And then refueling is a is a key advantage too. Fuel cell vehicles are refueled in less than 15 minutes. And what that means is that the vehicle asset is back on the road and um, providing service for the, the fleet operator. And so it's only uh, downtime is a, a few minutes to uh, fill up and then it's back in service. So that's about uh, the vehicle performance and where we see the sweet spot for hydrogen vehicles. But the question is, what about fueling? Where is the hydrogen gonna come to, from? As I mentioned, there's already over 6,000 fuel cell vehicles operating on the road. These are heavy duty vehicles operating in fleet conditions and they're being fueled at centralized refueling stations. So the infrastructure is starting to be developed. What we're typically seeing is that um, fleet operators go out to the marketplace and get competitive bids for the infrastructure and hydrogen fuel. And operators are paying a uh, price per kilogram and that price is encompassing the fuel, but also infrastructure and delivery. And so that makes budgeting really easy. Uh, you know what your vehicle is consuming and you know your price per kilogram. Um, hydrogen stations are easily scalable, and so it's um, an operation similar to compressed natural gas stations. They use a, a fairly small footprint at the depot, and um, you pull the vehicle up to the dispenser, so you don't have that vehicle tied up to charging infrastructure for hours at a time. And you don't need that individual infrastructure for each vehicle or every couple of vehicles. Now, right now, of course, most hydrogen is being produced through natural gas, but we're seeing uh, expansion of options for renewable green hydrogen. So I wanted to give an example of what one transit agency is doing in California to um, demonstrate what the future could hold. This is Sunline Transit. Um, Sunline operates in Palm Desert, so really one of the most extreme, hottest climates in North America. They've been operating fuel cell buses for uh, 20 years now, so they're one of the, the pioneers. They currently have a fleet of about 16 fuel cell buses. Sunline recently published their um, plan that shows how they're going to transition the fleet to 100% zero emissions. This is a requirement of California transit agencies to have this plan in place to show how they're going to go completely electric. Now Sunline's plan, when they published it, they um, show a mix of about 85% fuel cell vehicles. And when they did their analysis, it showed that really um, having a high proportion of fuel cell vehicles made the most sense for their fleet in terms of getting the best performance, but also minimizing costs. Uh, to fuel this fleet, Sunline is actually producing their own hydrogen on site. They're a real leader in this space. They're taking advantage of solar power being in the desert, of course. Their electrolyzer hydrogen production plant will include um, the electrolyzer, of course, compression and storage, and then the station module with the dispenser where they actually refuel the vehicle. The electrolyzer that they've put in place can produce approximately 900 kilograms of hydrogen today, which is enough to supply demand for 32 buses. Um, and the system is highly scalable. So I believe what they're doing is starting with one dispenser and then as their fleet grows, they'll add an additional dispenser on site. Um, so you can take this type of uh, system one step further. Here's a diagram of what it could look like at the utility scale, for instance. What it is, is a, a very large electrolyzer sited at a, a location where there's access to low cost electricity, low cost renewable electricity, of course, so solar or wind. The hydrogen is produced in that location um, for a very cost effective means and then transported to uh, a group of consumers. So in this case, it's a group of uh, transit agencies that have fueling sites. And so they're all accessing this one piece of infrastructure. Here's an example of what that could look like. Um, this example happens to be Southern California. So the area in yellow is all of the um, low cost renewable energy. And then there's transit agencies located within a 120 mile radius of that. And really that's where it's the most cost effective and makes the most sense to transport the fuel any further than that and you're, you're losing efficiencies. Um, but really what the keys are here is having a, a pool of hydrogen demand, customers that can, um, can gather their um, 
demand. I am running out of time. I'm going to jump ahead to my last slide just so that I can show a little bit about what we're forecasting for the cost of green hydrogen. As you can see, um, in the fairly near future, it's dropping down to a dollar, two dollars per kilogram. That's equivalent to about four dollars at the pump for the hydrogen, which is very competitive with diesel. Um, and that's not too far out. So I'll leave it there for now. Uh, looking forward to, to all the questions. Thank you. Great, thank you for that presentation, Catherine. All right, now we're gonna open up to uh, questions for our panel. So continue to use that chat. We have about 10 minutes here to um, talk to our expert panel. So um, if you all wanna turn your camera back on, we can jump into that section of the webinar. So first question is I'll open it up to anybody or all of you that want to answer, but a lot of questions coming in about infrastructure. Um, so I've heard that folks mentioned it's kind of a chicken and egg problem when it comes to hydrogen fueling stations. We need stations to support vehicles, but vehicles make them cost effective. So what will get us from talking about hydrogen fueling stations to implementation and how do we get over that hump? And whoever wants to kick it off can go ahead. I'll take a first crack at it. Um, uh, our Washington just published what they call a state energy strategy um, that was called for out of our 100% clean bill in 2019. And a couple of the things they identified is that it has to be done in parallel. And just like charging infrastructure, uh, fueling infrastructure has to be publicly supported initially. Um, and our state energy strategy actually called for a a statewide sort of assessment um, and an advisory group, if not maybe a state agency, to oversee the infrastructure planning for deploying fueling stations, which I thought was a creative idea. Um, but we clearly have to get ahead of it. And I think in hydrogen, and, and Jason or others may want to weigh in, if, if the fueling stations aren't there, um, uh, the vehicles obviously can't have uptake. So we've got to develop them at least in parallel. Um, and so that's what we're looking here in Washington. We hope to, to get funding this session for, I, I don't know, I'm hoping three to six stations. Uh, the provincial government in BC just added funding for another 10 and California's doing the same, so. Just to kind of add to that, I mean, hydrogen is very much sort of a, a scale game, right? Getting it started is the hard part, hard part. And then once you get it going, it can, it gets into a virtuous cycle where it builds on itself, builds on itself, the more volume decreases the price, which increases the demand for it. So then you can keep building it out, building it out, building it out. Uh, and as Dave pointed out, it is a challenge in that, you know, you can't, unlike battery electric vehicles, where you can start with the vehicles and then build DC fast chargers as needed to help improve sort of the customer appeal of the vehicle. Uh, you know, with fuel cell vehicles, you can't do that. You have to have the hydrogen fueling station to start to even bring the vehicles. I'll add, you know, for our project, um, because we have a known use for most of the hydrogen we're going to create uh, in our partnership with Northwest Natural, we can take a stream off of hydrogen off of that and and stand up a, a fueling station. So it, like like Dave mentioned, so, you know, we have another reason to make hydrogen. Now we can uh, put a, a fueling station at the same location uh, for little additional cost. And then we have our own fleet also located at that location. So you know, there we have, uh, we can, can start to convert some of our vehicles to uh, hydrogen vehicles, and now it starts to make sense. Great. Thank you, everyone. And one more question kind of related to infrastructure and uh, transporting fuel. Um, are there places that there are uh, hydrogen uh, being uh, transported via pipelines? And what is needed to scale out this infrastructure as well? And then also, are there other applications for shipping um, hydrogen as well, such as just trucking? Well, clearly, pipelines are going to be a, a major carrier. I know we've got Mitsubishi Power um, building the project in Utah to store hydrogen in the salt domes and then generate using combined cycle turbines and converting the entire natural gas uh, turbine generation over to, um, hydrogen. And, 
Uh, GE and Siemens are also retrofitting their turbines. So pipelines are going to be an essential part of that. Um, you know, once we get to 100% hydrogen by pipelines, I'll let the, the, some of the pipeline experts and alloy experts talk about what we'll need there. But um, yeah, clearly, so pipeline transportation will be critical. As an example, right, there's a hydrogen station in Torrance, California, that is supplied by pipeline because there's hydrogen pipeline in the area. Um, so there are some hydrogen pipelines in the U.S., but they're predominantly sort of in the Gulf area and then kind of Southern California area. Um, as it relates to using the natural gas grid, right, the big challenge with that is embrittlement of the metals in the pipeline. So you have to have a different sort of metal uh, metallurgy, metal combination in the pipes for the natural gas pipelines to handle an increased percentage of hydrogen mix. Uh, alternatively, you have to reline the, the pipeline. So put an in, inner liner inside the pipeline that, that then can contain the hydrogen safely and allowing a higher mix. Um, so, you know, it, it's not an impossible question. Um, also on infrastructure, I know I've been working with some of the states up in the um, sort of upper Midwest area, and they're pretty keen on using ammonia as their transportation because there's a lot of ammonia pipelines already in existence, and ammonia can be a good carrier for hydrogen as well. We, right. we looked at uh, whether you could truck it economically and it, it just, it doesn't pencil out. There's, there, the economics are poor for trying to uh, compress it and, and truck it. Great, thanks everyone. A um, couple questions have also come in about uh, safety in regard to uh, mobility applications specifically and also kind of other specific like use cases like logging and agriculture construction. Um, anyone want to touch on kind of those standards for hydrogen? I'll touch on the short haul uh, trucking. Uh, one of the ideas that Douglas PD is looking at uh, and their senator there, they're uh, one of the capitals of the tree fruit industry, right? Apples and cherries and such. And they have a uh, round trip short haul round trip trucking needs, take going out to the orchards, picking the fruit up and bringing it back to the warehouse and then the long distance trucking. And they think that's a, a, a great application and they have uh, logging uh, and timber hauling up there as well. So they're looking at short haul heavy duty applications. Uh, we're we're going to be talking to some OEMs and seeing if we can get some vehicles up there in the next year or two. And There's manufacturers of um, excavators and mining equipment that are moving into the hydrogen space and, and developing initial vehicles for demonstration purposes. So the off-road vehicles is for sure a potential application. But also with respect to safety, um, we have no uh, Center for Hydrogen Safety, um, which is doing the part of educating all those workers on, uh, you know, dealing with incidents. Um, this is taken pretty seriously, but also we should not forget we have an existing hydrogen infrastructure already in the in the states and globally. So uh, they have been dealing with uh, safety, you know, for a while, like having leak leak detectors, and it's it it is a it, it is a uh, highly flammable um uh it is highly flammable but it's it's lighter than air so it basically it just disperses in the air it's not not such as gasoline which kind of pools on on the ground so you know if uh, there are any accidents um or incidents you know is basically it just goes up in the air instead of like destroying everything all around you yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of tackle this head on. Everybody always thinks about the Hindenburg when they hear hydrogen, right? And that's just sort of the layperson, you know, uninformed knowledge of, of the substance, right? Um, it's, if you look at the Hindenburg, for example, most of the burning that you see of that was not the hydrogen burning. Because again, to, to uh, Martin's point, the, the hydrogen basically goes straight up in the air at 40 miles an hour, right? So it's super, super light comparatively. Um, it, if we look at like the tanks in the Mirai, right, it, they are carbon fiber like woven like spun around the tanks you know about that thick of carbon fiber we've shot those with 50 cal armor piercing rounds and have not had you know explosions or anything from that uh, we've tried comparing internal combustion engine fire versus hydrogen fire basically wherever you have the leak from hydrogen shooting straight up and if it ignites that you end up with a little like torch that's shooting straight up right 
compared to an internal combustion vehicle where it cools underground and engulfs the vehicle in flames. Um, I liken the safety concerns on hydrogen to those that people often have for battery electric vehicles. Yeah, lithium ion batteries are very flammable. They can explode. They can go for the vehicle to flames, uh, similar for gasoline, right? But these are things that we have safeties and standards around and we get comfortable with as humans and the benefits far outweigh the, the potential downside in no small part because of the mitigating factors that we have and prevention activities that we have around them. everyone for those thoughtful responses. We're going to do one more question to wrap up. Um, so if anybody wants to chime in here, Martina kind of hinted at this in her presentation, but currently a majority of hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels. So I just would like to touch on where does renewable hydrogen come into play for decarbonizing the grid and transportation and kind of what is the outlook on, on that and what is needed to, to get to that point? You know, many, um, there is a discussion also like a hydrogen rainbow, um, you know, hydrogen, they say it's labeled with different colors. Uh, renewable hydrogen or electrolytic hydrogen is considered as green hydrogen. And then many of the other colors, such as red hydrogen, brown hydrogen, black hydrogen, blue hydrogen, pink hydrogen, so many colors. So it can be quite dis like distracting, but you know, there's always some kind of fossil fuel involved to produce the hydrogen, while green hydrogen is purely produced from renewable electricity. So, we kind of, you know, as a society, when we create those policies, we have to kind of decide where do we want to go, what do we want to support. Does it make sense to, you know, many say we would need blue hydrogen to ramp up, scale up quickly? But we will have to invest into um, infrastructure, you know, that might not be needed in 10 years because policies might not be there to, to support it in the end. So um, what we see here in the Pacific Northwest is that we have support for renewable hydrogen while other forms of hydrogen, you know, they don't really seem to get support, especially from environmental and social justice groups. You know, we have to... We have to take into account all the different stakeholders, and there is definitely support for the others. Not so much. Any other thoughts from the panel on that? Uh, real quickly, if it's about grid integration, the only seasonal storage vessel we have right now. Uh, for the grid as we increase our variable renewable energy is hydrogen. Um, no other form can get you from July to January. So um, that alone, and we will need vast amounts of storage is that the slide that Jason uh, showed her in his presentation, so. In, in the Northwest, our carbon footprint is greatly impacted by our transportation production. And the only way to get green energy that we have an excess of in the Northwest into the transportation market is through through hydrogen or electric vehicles. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, Sebi, you want to close us out? Yeah, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today as we discuss renewable hydrogen programs. Um, we want to say a big thank you to our sponsor, uh, Toyota. Thank you to our speakers, Martina, Kathy, Jason, David, and Mike, and as well as you, Carter, for moderating this panel. Uh, another additional information, I know we did not get through all of the questions uh, today. Um, we will be sending a recap email shortly after the webinar, and then um, we will include the information from our um, from our speakers today, and uh, we will have the opportunity to continue that conversation offline as well. And we have our next webinar in the series uh, on Tuesday, January 26th, where we will be discussing electrified community car sharing. Our program manager, Kelly Yurick, will be joined by uh, Colorado Car Share, um, 
their mobility as well as uh, the UC Davis, uh, UC Davis as well to speak on and highlight car sharing projects and platform and how we can make electric vehicles accessible to everyone. So we do hope you can join us there as well. We thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to um, myself at Cindy at UY at fourthmobility.org. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.